Welcome, everyone. Chief McPhee and the Chief C4 podcast. This is episode eight. It's going to be a great conversation with a uh, good friend of mine, Mr. Sean Ravy. He uh, he and I grew up together uh, in uh, the Upper Peninsula of, of Michigan. Um, hung out a lot as uh, young boys and uh, graduated high school together. And um, we kind of went separate ways after we um, graduated high school, but 30 some years later, circles around and we're in the same line of work. Um, I'm at the end of my career and uh, he's in the uh, prime of his career. So uh, we're gonna talk about that. And um, his story is uh, legendary. Uh, you know, it has been his, his journey to get to where he is now has been a 35 year uh, life journey, pursuing his childhood dream of being a police officer some of the uh, hurdles that um, he's overcome in his life to get there. He's going to talk about that. Um, just a great story. He's a great storyteller, um, very decorated officer um, for a, a large urban uh, police agency out west uh, in Arizona. He uh, specializes in uh, child abuse cases, which anybody in the business knows that's a very difficult area to work. And uh, most people aren't going to work it for any length of time because um, it, it's so emotionally draining and, and it's just a tough tough uh, thing to do for a long period of time. But he has um, done over 1,000 uh, child abuse cases with a very high success uh, pro conviction rate. And we're going to talk about his career doing that. As a result of that specialty, um, he has created, uh, uh, he is the founder and president of Put on the Cape, a foundation for hope, a uh, nonprofit organization that brings the world of mythical superheroes uh, into child advocacy centers uh, for the purpose of empowering children um, who are suffering from acute physical and sexual abuse. And he's going to kind of lay out uh, how that organization works. It's just a great. Uh, Great organization. I believe he's in 15 different states now. So um, we're going to talk about that a little bit. And, uh, you know, he is a, he's a self-proclaimed uh, uh, comic book nerd. And uh, he'll talk about, you know, that's kind of why his the superhero thing happened with, uh, with his organization. So um, he's also a great writer he uh has a degree in journalism and you can tell everything he writes even down to his face you know his uh, social media posts um they're written in a way that you can tell somebody uh knows what they're doing and he's just quick-witted um you know sean could probably do stand-up comedy if you wanted he's uh he's that quick um so looking real forward to uh to having this great conversation and catching up with an old friend uh so please uh Stay tuned and, and welcome into the C4 studio, everybody's modern superhero, Mr. Sean Ravy. What separates us? people. story. This is Ellison. Mama, Welcome to Chief's C4 Podcast, where top cars and current events are the preferred topics of discussion. I only 
MC, aka The Chief, is a 30-year veteran detective of the Michigan State Police, an avid hot rod builder and automotive connoisseur, a Native American, and a proud father of two sons, both members of the U.S. Army, Michigan National Guard, 125th Infantry Regiment. This podcast is not intended for the weak at heart. Alpha males are always welcome, and honest opinions are always given. Now buckle your seatbelt. You are now entering the No Snowflake Zone. All right, I think we're rolling uh, sound. We got video. I think finally, after some uh, technological glitches, we finally uh, made it in the studio here. Um, In the uh, C4 podcast studio, with me tonight, very special guest. Um, I want to introduce Mr. Sean Ravy. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you again, Kyle. Doing you great. Too. It's been a long time. It has. Yeah. So just to get everybody up to speed, how Sean and I know each other. We grew up together um, in uh, St. Ignace in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And um, we did a lot of hanging around together when we were younger. Had some uh, similar um, uh, shit. We graduated high school together. Uh, if I remember right, um, you and I, we were really into uh, collecting baseball cards and stuff when we were young. Yeah. And I I could collect them, but Sean could memorize every statistic on the back of every one of these cards, man. You always knew everybody's batting average. Do you remember that? I do. That's why nobody wanted to play Trivial Pursuit with me. Yeah. I still have... A shitload of fucking baseball cards from when I was a kid. I still have them. I've got my shoe boxes. I also have about 10,000 comic books that Trey and I used to go down and collect. Yeah, yeah. So uh, self-proclaimed comic book nerd. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, are in life. Yeah. We also uh, played sports together. We, um, we played basketball together, and we were on the uh, – 1983 state championship football team together, correct? That was a heck of a game in the Silver Dome. That was. How about playing for? Uh, how about playing for Barry Pearson? Rather intense. <laughs> yeah. yep. but the cool thing I saw him probably two years ago when I came home for car show at uh, one of the restaurants in town that's now closed. Sadly, is one of my favorites. He he was walking out and he saw me in the back and he stopped and he waved. So I got up and walked up to him, gave him a big hug. I haven't seen him in 30 years. Yeah. Was just, he, was, he was a builder of men. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get him I'm gonna get him on here sooner or later somehow. I still remember your flat-toed uh, kicking shoe that you had. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Through. He, uh, you know, we had somewhat of a little reunion up there uh, a few years back. Um, uh, they honored the team and the, the Hall of Fame there and that kind of thing. And, and um we had an opportunity to have uh, some drinks at the local establishment. He was there, and he hasn't changed a bit. He's still the same way. In fact, um, you know, my kids were growing up, and we would go up to my mom and dad's, and, um, you know, we were trying to get them stuff to do. And so we would go to the local bowling alley right there on Ferry Lane, and we were bowling. And uh, I've never been a good bowler. I'm just kind of like golf. I just go out and do it, and, you know, I'm just a hack for the most part. Well, you know him. He he was um, he was there, and he was sitting there and watching me uh, bowl. And um, he had to coach me. Wow! And he was like, "No, nah, you're not doing this right. You got to do this." And you know, I mean, every he just he's a coach all the time, no matter what. He is. Uh, he is a builder of men. You're absolutely correct. So, um, so uh, we also our fathers were best friends when they were younger old hot rodders from the 50s and 60s car nuts no. car shows you know all the classic cars to this day still buddies living oh. up in the upper peninsula and they're still competing with who's got the coolest car yes legendary stories legendary i remember back when you know that dad had his health and he could get out and, and create shenanigans ravy style he had to go get his hair thinned because he's got such thick, he's like a lion mane, this guy. Yes. And he put it in a baggie and left it in your dad's mailbox. Because <laughs> <laughs> he is my ball, as you know. Because my old man doesn't have any hair, right? With one of the many ravey stories. Oh, my God, that man. Shenanigans. 
shenanigans. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yeah, they're uh, they still um, still doing their thing up there now. They they were uh, your dad is is legendary uh, in the automotive world. Obviously, uh, the creator and founder of the Saint Ignis Car Show back in the seventies. Um, I remember that um, when they did that. Uh, my dad and your dad and like four or five other guys started it. There's like six cars that started this car show and it grew to this mammoth show, right? The eighties were like Woodstock, man. It just, it That's, was off the hook. It was when Carol Shelby showed up and, you know, we got to drive around in a Shelby Mustang and who would, who would ever imagine, you know, the George Barris. And I remember when Tom Monahan landed his, his helicopter over by old Detman's. And then walked up and brought us to Domino's Lodge. I mean, just and all the cool rock and roll shows that came in. And the crew. Oh my lord. You um it was always when I would go up there, I knew you were always busy because that your dad would make you work and stuff at the show. And in uh, I was always curious. I'm like, all right, let's go to the parade. I gotta see what car Sean's gonna be driving, because they always gave you some hot car to drive. Trans Am Corvette, ZR1 Corvette, just the new Camaros. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, what a heyday! And so, are you uh, are you in possession of any hot cars these days? I have a 2014 Dodge Challenger Redline Special Edition. Nice, it is glorious. 425 horsepower. Just put a new cold air intake in it. Got some beautiful uh, SP50s. You know, what color? It is white, but it has a black and red pinstripe, and it's got black chrome and red inlays in the, in the wheels. Very nice. Yes, really fun to drive. Guys, very good. Oh yeah, I think you got the you got the Mustang. Yeah, I got I got some old uh, hot rods. I got the old Fox body Mustang. Um we got a little nitrous set up in the back of that um <clears throat> to add some juice to it, but you know, I, I don't use that too much cuz I don't want to blow the inside of the engine all apart, but I got that and I have uh a 63 Chevy pickup truck that we put a, a hot rod engine in and put some fat meats on the back of that. It's kind of an old shop truck. And, um, my, my son, Dylan, who's kind of got the bug. He, um, he's gone through just about as many cars as I did when I was a kid. He is, he's gone through, uh, I think a Camaro now he's had, um, I think he's had a Jeep and, uh, now he is in a Dodge charger um srt or an rt he's in an rt i think it's a 12 bright red of course chrome wheels all the you know i still remember when you let me take a couple laps around in the the blue goose the charger on the track yeah uh, allegedly yes uh, that was a lot of fun <laughs> yes yeah i think there's still video floating around of that somewhere there is and uh your instructor said i could have qualified given a few more runs out there. <laughs> that's a great place over there so much fun yeah so that was uh growing up that's kind of what we did up there uh got in a lot of mischief had a lot of fun and um uh you've had some interesting um you've met a lot of interesting people uh i follow your social media you always have really good stuff on there and growing up and to this day i'm a huge pro wrestling fan always have been and you got to meet, I saw a picture on your social media from the early 90s. You met Macho Man Randy Savage. Tell me about that. I did. My my uh, roommate and I at the time, Jamie Butler, he and I went to the Lansing, Lansing Civic Center for a show. And we were in the back parking lot. And uh, Cadillac pulls in, Undertaker, Paul Bear gets out, in character. You know, it's scary. Wow. Huge, huge man. Uh, Ricky Steamboat talked to us, and uh, next thing you know, here comes Howard Finkel driving Randy Savage, and he gets out, and I'm like, "Holy crap, this is Randy Savage!" And he had he was announcing that he wasn't a full time wrestler, but uh, Sid Vicious no showed, and so Randy <laughs> wrestled that. Time. Is that right? All right, Mister uh, Mister Madness, they called him. So Did you like, ever? Go ahead. Have you ever gone to any WrestleManias? WrestleMania three in the Pontiac Silverdome. You were there. I was there. One of the ninety three thousand lunatics. Oh my God! One of my best friends here in town. He was. He's on the Chiefs uh, podcast with me on Saturdays. We do it. He uh, he was there as well, and he said it was just off the hook. It was. You couldn't believe such a thing would be that many people and just the noise. But I remember, of course, asking Randy Savage if I could get a picture with him, and you know, 
who knew if this was his character or this who he really was? You know, all gruff, yeah, whatever, man. You know, come on over. So, you know, you go to take pictures with people, you put your arm around them. As soon as I raised my arm, he squared up on me and said, hey, back off, I ain't your girlfriend. <laughs> Did he really? Yeah, I thought he was going to punch me right in the face. So the picture you see, I'm laughing. Actually, I'm scared to death. <laughs> this no, guy. They, they said he's he in real life, he was a really paranoid guy. Very paranoid, always carried a gun. Did he really? Yeah, always in his fanny pack, which he was wearing. But, yeah, he was. And Jamie, if, I'll make sure he watches this. He was dying. He was laughing so hard. That's but, true. Yeah, that's when I met uh, met Randy Savage, you know, met Mick Foley and Jeff Jarrett and uh, a lot of cool people in some of my travels in life. You have. And then uh, I read a story, too, where you posted. You met, um, when you were young, you met Al Kaline. I did. We were Little League. It was 1977. I was 10. We went down Quentin Goodrow Drove. I remember it rained all the way there, and by the time we got into Detroit City Limits, the sun came out. Was it on one of the Little League uh, trips to Tiger Stadium? Yeah, it was. So we're in the, you know, Tiger Stadium. You walk in there and you see that blue. It was, I think the uh, the outfield wall was blue at the time. And the green grass. And it's like, wow. Because, you know, growing up in the UP, come on. <laughs> we, right. We, we don't have access to that kind of thing. I was down in the main area, and here comes the service elevator from the press box. Out walks Al Kaline. Just ran up. He signed my, my, uh program signed my batting glove tussled my hair asked me if i was a lefty tigers needed left-handed pitching I just walked off i was like holy crap very gracious man no oh, very gracious man wow. and, uh, the next year i meet christopher reeve superman did you really that man that must have been huge for you yeah because uh you know dad got the uh, the period piece cars for somewhere in time movie oh so they invited us over there to watch some of the scenes being uh, shot um, in the Grand Hotel, and we watched the scene that he's in the attic and finds himself in the in the registry book, and the scene that he's talking to himself in the mirror about meeting Miss, you know, Elise McKinnon. You don't know me yet, but you will. Then they took the time to come over and talk to us, and imagine being 10, 11 and meet Superman. That's tremendous, I, man. So big, he's so big. My my hand disappeared into his hand. You know, he knelt, he got down on his knee. And he entered, you know, he bent down to get eye level with me. He was so big, which is something I've carried on with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, my cosplay group, they all, we all know how to deal and talk with little kids to not scare them. Right. You know, Christopher Plummer and Jane Seymour, but I met Superman. I mean, wow. Man. You know, what's funny when they were making that movie over there, myself and Jim, uh, I think Jimmy Benjamin and Becker and Brown, we all went over there and we signed up to be extras and they need, they needed a kid for one spot. Uh, of course, a bunch of other people signed up and it was like, uh, if I remember right, the scene was, we were supposed to be riding a bike down the street or something. And, um, I haven't seen the movie in years, so I don't really remember it, but, um, we all signed up for it and they had a little contract kind of thing. And we we're all excited. None of us got picked. <laughs> so, really good memory. Yeah. Yeah. Really so, yeah, that was uh, that was something. So, yeah, you have uh, and plus where uh, where you're working now, you got a lot of big events that come out there to Glendale, right? Oh yeah, the large urban police department for uh, for whom I work, we do. I got to work the Super Bowl detail a couple years ago. It was absolutely awesome. Yeah, it was uh, on the main on the main floor where the players and all and the Hall of Famers were. I got to escort them to the elevators and to the interview segments and. I was put in charge of Deion Sanders for the night. Nice. It's just it's cool. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I was uh, I was telling the story um, to someone the other day. I said um, when I was at when I was at Ipsy, uh, we did the Michigan games. They put us down on the on the sidelines at the Michigan games and um, in the uh, early '90s. And I had I met Bo Schembechler down there and uh, met a lot of those guys. And I, uh, Gary Moeller, and I was in the locker room there. A few times and um you know there was it just some of the people i met uh, i spent the day i was in charge remember when uh in the early 90s florida state university came up and played michigan it was been 92 93 bobby bowden was the head coach uh they brought him up um and he was staying over in novi at some big hotel they put me in charge of going over and getting him and his wife bringing them to the stadium for the game and then what we did is uh, we had to get uh, – he was in my car, my patrol car, him and his wife. 
and then the team buses there's two team buses and we would follow them to the stadium and our PD uh locked down the main thoroughfare and we just went right blasted through all the lights right it was like a, a escort type of deal so we're blasting through we're running late of course we're blasting through the city of ann arbor um uh, and in front of the first bus a dog slips its leash and runs in front of the bus a large black dog that's all i can remember and Sean, the only thing I hear is thump, 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 three times right over this poor dog. Yeah. And I couldn't, and the wife was going, she she went crazy in the back seat. Um, I couldn't avoid it. And so uh, she was really uh, distraught. So we got there on time, got the coach out and everything. And she went out of her way. Uh, she insisted that we go back, find the owner. And she she made it right with them uh, for that dog. It was It was pretty impressive what she did, but. Uh, he was such a gracious guy. Um, he sent me stuff in the mail after the game, like a shirt and something else. So, um, yeah. And he had his own personal trooper, um, uh, Billy Smith, still still around, I guess, to this day. But he was pretty old at the time, and he rode in the front seat, and he went everywhere uh, that Bobby went. So, pretty, yeah, we meet some pretty interesting people doing this stuff. We do. Uh, we yeah. had some presidential yeah. details here. Weren't you on the cover of Sports Illustrated with Desmond Howard getting a touchdown pass? Yeah, that that was uh, one of my things. It was uh, I was in the background of one of the centerfolds of Sports Illustrated where Desmond Howard caught a pass in the end zone when he was making his Heisman run, and uh, we were supposed to. It was uh, September. We hadn't switched over to. Um, you know, we were still in long sleeves. We went. We went early. We were. In, it was either in September or October. They put us in long sleeves. And uh, it was like 85 degrees uh, during this game. And I was down on the field and I was just dying. So, you know, I rolled my sleeves about halfway up my arm because it was dying. And they took that picture. And so, you know, that's a, like a major violation in uniform for us. That's a no, no. Yeah. So that was on a Saturday. Uh, <laughs> the magazine comes out, I don't know, a couple weeks later, a week later. I get called into the post commander's office. They got the magazine on the desk. And there's my, he goes, that's you. And I said, yeah, 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 it is. You got me. You know, I can't argue that. But uh, I got a little ass chewing for it. And, uh, you know, then they uh, put it in my file. So, yeah, you get caught sometimes. You do. You really I saw do. you. Um, two great pictures of you. Photo bombing. Was it ESPN or one of the NFL network sets? The NFL network, yeah. <laughs> that was tremendous. Yeah, yeah, Sam. Was doing an interview with uh, with one of the Baltimore Ravens, and uh, I would just kind of move myself. <laughs> and I was in the photo the entire time. It was off. Awesome. Yeah, it was almost more center stage than the guys that were actually talking. Yeah, it was yeah, great picture. Thumb, thumbs and duty belt, looking all stern and everything. So. Yeah, that was awesome, man. That was great. So. <laughs> The reason I wanted to bring you on here is a I wanted to talk to you because I haven't seen you in so long, and um, you know you are you are in the middle of your career, and uh, I'm at the end of mine. I got about 45 work days left, wow. and that's going to be 31 for me. And uh, enough is enough. And um, you know that's kind of why I do these things. I like going back and finding people that I haven't got to talk to in a long time. You know, in in the business that you know for 30 years I haven't got to. I I couldn't really say anything about a lot of things that we were doing and. Um, you know, you just kind of miss, uh, talking to people that you used to know. So you kind of, kind of reconnect with them now. And what are they going to do to me now? Fire me, you know? So, but, um, but your story, um, your story getting to where you got is credible. It's an incredible story. And I wanted you to tell it to, uh, everybody that, you know, all five people that may listen to this, um, your story of after you left the, uh, after you left the UP, um, you came upon some hard times in, uh, from what I'm reading, a 35 year journey to make it to your, to your childhood dream of becoming a police officer. Is that correct? It is correct. And, you know, growing up, we had every jurisdiction on the planet in St. Agnes, the county sheriff, the city, the state, the uh, tribal police. And, you know, we have some, some awesome state troopers in the UP, you know, Paul, Paul Sved being one of those mm -hmm. and uh, McGraw and uh, Hardy. Tons of, I mean, we had so many great role models growing up and Paul was mine. And I remember when I was a little, you know, maybe five years old, he brought my dad home from work and the, 
the, the blue goose and it just hit me like you know i just saw superman you know this you know the way he carried himself and you know paul he's a big man yeah i just told him then i want to grow up and be just like you you know one day and it, you know life life lends you a lot of different directions and i had a, i had a talent that a, a well-meaning english teacher didn't think should be wasted being a cop i was going to ask you about that um is it you know um, who was it are you uh, going to name or no uh ks were her initials really she uh she she wanted you to do that huh yeah she was she was mortified that i would even think of wasting my talent in writing to uh, be a cop but uh you have to really have a lot of depth to be a police officer and uh, a lot of education to do it so i listened to her and went on became a journalist for a while got married decided i was going to test wife said no too dangerous uh got divorced tested uh passed i was in my 30s now i think i was 34. and soon as i went to do the physical they said we're sorry we've got a hiring freeze on that was for msp yeah right it was for msp and they so i got stuck in that freeze and they didn't unfreeze it till after i'd gone past 35 years old and that was the limit then i don't think you guys have one now so i would you know that was i thought my last shot uh to become a police officer i started a mortgage company uh with a partner and uh in 06 you know what happened to the economy it made great money lived on gros Eel, you know had a lexus and a mercedes coupe and all the fun things big house i lost everything um ended up moving back into the to my dad's house and i was 39 years old and that's pretty humbling to say the very least because like me i mean I, we grew up together and all we ever talked about was getting out of there and doing yeah. something. And here I was back with nothing, uh, nothing. I had no money. I had a Jeep Liberty and six trash bags of my stuff. That was it. That's all I, all I was able to salvage. And uh, my father, I still remember I was out in the garage feeling sorry for myself. And he came out and allowed a pity party for 15 minutes. He said, get it out, do whatever you needed to do come back inside and he had the yellow notebook eight you know 11 by 14 legal pad out doing the pros and the cons and getting yourself out of this mess and so i decided i was going to go to the little tiny setting this library you know i put a hoodie on and a hat and i had grown a beard i didn't want people to even say hi and know i was home and i had failed a life to me i had but i got an email from someone i had met through a mutual acquaintance who lost his, uh, he was a custom home builder and lost his company. And he came out to Arizona and his uncle was a builder here. So he was working for him and the market was booming out here then. It took a while for what happened in Michigan to catch up out here. And he sent me an email, said, do you still want to be a police officer? And everyone I knew well always heard the story of Sean wanting to be a police officer. I know I, I bored people with that, but I never gave up on it. I, I just always felt so empty because I had a, attained success elsewhere in life, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. you know? And then I saw you and, you know, someone I know in my whole life, I still remember your photo in the St. Agnes News graduating the police academy and your dress blues. And <laughs> I still remember that, you know, and it's like, yeah, almighty. And so he sent me that email said, I'm in Phoenix. There's billboards everywhere. They're hiring a thousand cops, no age limit. So I went on phoenix.gov, I saw when the agency was hiring and what I needed to do physical fitness wise. And I went home and started to train. Um, needed to run a mile and a half for a certain time. Figured, hey, I'm an athlete, but didn't realize the total the stress of losing everything had taken on me. I had lost about 25 pounds. Wow. The stress I was in, I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating. Broke out in shingles. Uh, and within a quarter mile, I was on the side of the road throwing up. Couldn't, wow. couldn't even make a half mile. I remember I come home because I was going to keep a log every day and just had a DNF on day one. And then slowly I was able to build up, did the push-ups, did the sit-ups, flew out to Phoenix, um, borrowed money, took the physical and the written on the same day. We had, I, I guess, conservatively 250 people in line that day to take the written test. And you had to score a certain amount to go to the physical test and, mm. and or you'd go home. I passed the, the written, did the physical, it was 100 degrees. 
Dry, dry heat, though. Dry heat. Uh, dry heat. Uh, like my head was in an oven. But I still remember that last lap when I came in and they called out my time and I was under my time. Just the weight of the world just came off of me. I passed both steps. We went in a little conference room and only 33 people out of 200 plus made it that wow. far. Um, got the background pack, went home, collected all the information. Still hadn't heard from anyone in Phoenix uh, at the end of October. Uh, that was September 30th, 2006, I flew out here. So I just packed my Jeep up, told my dad, I'm, I'm coming anyway. You know, I didn't have a job. I didn't have a place to live. Mm -hmm. I just felt that I could do this. And, you know, the, well, a lot of people haven't even heard of the Mackinac Bridge, which is puzzling. But I remember that I'll never forget this night <clears throat> that I was in the kitchen with my dad. It was Friday night, the night the Tigers lost the World Series to St. Louis. And it was 1030 because I was going to drive to Detroit. A friend that I had met in Arizona from Detroit flew to Detroit to drive out with me. Oh, wow. Because they knew the mental stress I was under. And they didn't want me to drive out here by myself. And Andrea, you were my guardian angel, I tell you. And uh, so I still remember I was in the kitchen with Dad. And I was leaning up against the sink. He was leaning up against the, the stove. And he said, I, I got something for you. And he handed me a bridge token. He goes, that's to get you there. And then he gave me another one and said, that's when you come back with your badge. And I still have both of them sitting on my shelf over there. That is awesome. Yeah. And he hugged me. It was sleeting and snowing. And I just put it in drive and headed west, man. <laughs> wow. got, got out here on November 1st, 2006. Didn't get hired till May 20th. May 21st, 2007. That really? Entire time I was doing landscaping, I was painting, I was ghost writing for, for authors, I was doing anything I could to survive, and I was training. Just hustling. I just, what else was I going to do? I, I already had nothing. Mm. <laughs> I didn't leave anything else. But the way I looked at it, Kyle, I was, I was here. And Michigan is, everything was dying in Michigan. And at least if I didn't make my goal here, I was still here and had an opportunity to do anything. Do you attribute that just staying after it, Sean? Do you attribute that just to be having some mental toughness and, and not taking no for, for an answer? Or what do you, once you got out there and said, holy shit, I'm not going to get hired until May, I got to survive here. It was tough because, you know, the people, a lot of people said, hey, you know, it was a great dream. You know, because it kept dragging and dragging and dragging. I'm out of money. I'm, I'm doing everything I can to survive. I lived in my Jeep for a couple of weeks. And I said, no, I, I got this. I never in one moment doubted that this was going to happen for me. It's just a matter of when. Were you the uh, oldest recruit in the academy? I was the, I think, the second oldest in my class. And I still remember in, when I got hired, finally, um, went to employment services. I'm sitting in the lobby. and I got this young kid staring at me and finally it became so annoying i looked at him and said what are you looking at he goes dude how old are you <laughs> like, i'm 40 why he goes dude you're only six years younger than my dad oh my gosh and his name was jimmy toon and uh he's still still an officer here i see him a couple times a week and i hug him every time i see him we went to the academy together i picked him as my partner that's awesome Test and uh, I had a lot of fun with Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, that's great, man. That's uh, so 2007. You got your badge. I did. Uh, dad came. Dad Ed came out. He did, and I gave him my badge, and he pinned it on my chest. Awesome the ceremony. So he must have been out. really proud of you. It, it was so cool. It, it was so cool. I kept saying we did it. He goes, "No, you did it." <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, all you need is one person to believe in you. And he was at. Yeah, absolutely. So and I remember the first time I came to St. Ignace, I went to see Paul. And I gave him my badge, too, and put it in his hand and thanked him. And nice. Five years later. That's a hell of a journey, man. That's yeah. great. So you've been, uh, so what, you got 13 years in? you 13 on May 21st. All right. And yeah. so you, uh, you kind of you got you kind of rose up to the uh, rank of detective fairly quickly. It sounds like, and um, you have been awarded the state 
of Arizona Police Officer of the Year Award on two occasions, and you have received a Distinguished Service Award from your own agency on two occasions. Is that correct? Correct. That's awesome, man. And then, you know, not everybody can do, you specialized in these child abuse cases, and I've done some of these. Um, and I've have friends that were were with the local police departments that were in those units. And I'm telling you, uh, just from the ones that I did, I can't imagine doing those for any length of time. And if I read my background, so you've done over 1,000 of those cases. I have. I spent six years in that unit. And <clears throat> it was pretty difficult. Um, you have to have a lot of internal drive and motivation to look past the darkness and there's a, so much training that goes into it so much finesse because you know one you're sitting with a child who's been abused by an adult and you got to follow protocols you have to follow protocol and that child you have to get that child to tell you what happened but open-ended questions you can't be suggestive you can't ask direct questions were they coached yeah exactly you know they have to disclose to you. And then two hours later, you're sitting across from a child molester trying to get them to admit to what they did. Yes. But that in itself is an education. Yeah. I mean, I remember feeling really dirty coming out of some of those interviews because you almost have to befriend them during the interview to get them to tell you what they did. And then you kind of walk out of there going, I want to strangle the son of a bitch. But, you know, you just know you can't do that. The trick is to minimize everything and as you said exactly be the friend and i i had a way of doing that that a lot of the times when it was over two or three hours later and they said what's next i said well what's next is you're going to jail and they were shocked yeah they yeah they, I, I thought we were friends and it was good to talk to you sean i'm you know sorry all this had to happen and then yeah. i I go in with my partner with my, my head and my, my hands, you know, just shocked. Yeah. Gravity. People don't understand, Sean, that uh, how awful children are treated in this country. It's, it's horrifying. It's and, awful. And the sad part is the, the abusers, you know, they groom them to believe that if they tell or people find out that bad things are going to happen to them. Yeah. They believe it. I handled uh, one of my bigger cases that I handled was um, uh, a homicide of a two month old infant. Um, they basically move in boyfriend was left to care for this infant and, uh, you know, abused the child to the point where it, uh, where it died. And I'm telling you what, that is, uh, that case is ingrained forever. Um, we got a conviction. We got 35 years, but uh, that case can be ingrained forever, man. It is. And, and the victories sometimes take a lot of that pain away, but the pain is still there. I don't know if you saw a couple months ago the, the hand-drawn child uh, picture I posted. I did. I read that story, man. That was, what, seven years it took you to get a conviction? Seven years. Unbelievable. And that was the biggest failing of my career. Um, they drew that photo for me, thanking me for helping them seven years ago. And we misfired twice. And finally, now that they're grown, I mean, yeah. teenagers, they're driving cars. You know, they're not even the same kids anymore. It's but, funny you mentioned that, that you, you call that a failure to yourself. I did the same thing. Um, you know, we, we I've had a pretty high conviction rate throughout my career. But uh, I've lost a couple um, cases that one in particular that will haunt me is uh, one of my troopers that worked for me got hit by a car out on the highway. And uh, he survived. He lived. But he uh, had some closed head injuries. He's fought back and he's back on the on the street. But it took him a long time. Um, there was no who done it here. We know who we knew who hit him. Uh, but the uh, the individual was an attorney. And, uh, we went to, uh, yeah, we didn't even make it to trial. It got tossed on a technicality, uh, on a direct verdict and, uh, by the judge. And I, to this day, I, I, I pissed off. I, I don't think there's anything I could have did differently, but, um, you know, you just, you don't want that L 
oh, that you know you're trying to fight for one of your guys and you get an L, that kind of haunts you. It does, and it takes a lot. Of, it takes a lot out of you. And you know, I, I started seeing six years in, and all the cases and all the late night callouts and the 36 hour days. It started taking a big toll on me. Um, my behavior started to change. You know, you don't see it. And thankfully, I had a supervisor who just said, "You're not you anymore." You know, yeah. You you need some time away from this. Yeah. And and so we yeah, but that case uh, finally, that man, he's a generational abuser. I mean, generational. He, I, there's so many lives he destroyed, and he's yeah. gone, he's gone away forever. That's great, man. I was uh, I was in a similar boat in 2015. I had my 25 in. I was just uh, yeah, I had my 25 in. I could leave, and um, I had to either leave or make a decision to sign up for what we call the drop program, which is a, a deferred retirement program. You got to go six years to get the payout, right? So I had to make a decision, and at that point, I was I was uh, pretty emotionally done because I was running two. I ran two major cases. Uh, that year in um, December of 14, one of our local um, sheriff deputies was killed in a high-speed pursuit. And um, the guy he was chasing was never identified. That was a whodunit. And it took us five days to identify who did it. And uh, we ended up going to trial and got a conviction. And he got 18 to 30 years or whatever. Uh, at the same time, one of the local teenagers here was killed by a, another sheriff's department on a traffic stop. Um, he, he had he was uh, resisting arrest and that kind of thing. And it, it, uh, it went to a very high profile case, very emotional. Both of those cases kind of ran over top of each other. And at the end of both of those cases, I was done, man. I was at the end of my rope and I said, I don't really have anything else I need to prove. I'm, I'm done. I was going to just call it good. And my wife says I had to make a decision by the next day. It was like uh, August 1st. I had to make a decision by, so July 31st, I'm out on my back deck having a drink and smoking a cigar, kind of relegated to the fact that I'm done. My wife says, maybe you should call your dad and get his opinion before you make your decision. So guess what? I get on the phone to dear old Buck. He says, lay out this drop program for me. So I said, all right. So, and at the time I'm 47 years old. Right. And um, he says, let me get this straight. You only have to work six more years, which will put you at 53 years old. You can retire. I said, yeah. He goes, right now you got a take home car. You can take off whenever you want. You can have vacation whenever you want. Uh, and then you get this big payout at the end of six years. He goes, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> so awesome. when he put it in that perspective, you know, he said, look, if you're 47, and you're going to have to probably go get another job somewhere. You're going to start at the bottom of the totem pole, and you're going to have to work for somebody and start all over kind of thing. And so when he put put it in that perspective, the next day I signed up for the drop program. And um, I did it, and then I had some assistance because I went back into my office, and I said, I don't know if I can handle any more of these cases. I, don't, I just didn't have the energy for them you know, anymore. I kind of lost it a little bit. And my boss, uh, bless his heart, you know, he uh, – he really did me a solid. He came over and I, would, I was the only detective for three counties uh, for MSP. There, I didn't have a partner. I was by myself. I had a trooper investigator, a couple of them that, at, that rotated through that were tremendous. But he came over and he said, hey, I'm, you know, I've been looking about, you know, getting you some help and because uh, the call outs were killing me. I just, you know, I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and so. He said, well, I'm going to bring this guy over from across the hall. He's running like uh, the tobacco tax team, which was a real low key, older troop, you know, position kind of thing. And I said, well, who's going to take his position? And he said, I'll find somebody. And I said, well, what if I want it? He said, <laughs> well, I'd give it to you. The next pay yeah. period, I was running the tobacco tax squad. So I kind of re-energized my batteries a little bit and I was able to hang around and, and uh, ride out the six years. But it was close, man. I didn't think I was going to make it. Now here you are. I am. I am 43, 44 days away, work days. So, oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so you made it. Um, you made it to, uh, to Arizona. You, um, you did over a thousand cases, which kind of segues us into um, what I wanted to talk to you about, too, is 
you created something called Superhero September in 2015. Is that right? Correct. Tell me, tell us a little. Now you are a big superhero guy. I don't know nothing about superheroes, but tell us what uh, Superhero September was, what it was for, and then what it turned into. Well, what it was is uh, the sim the simple thing. If you look at superheroes and how they became superheroes, it was always some tragic event or some adversity. You know, Batman's parents being killed, Superman's an orphan. You know, he lost his whole world. You know, Tony Stark took shrapnel to the chest. And Peter Parker was relentlessly bullied and lost his uncle, lost his parents. And yet when circumstances happened to them, they became heroes. And they used that incident to drive them to be heroic and help other people. And so I always resonated with Spider-Man because I was, you know, I grew up skinny and pimply with glasses and kind of a nerd. And so I was always into it. The movies that had, had started coming out, I was in, in Candyland, essentially. <clears throat> but it was during the, uh, the summer of 2015. It was in July. I was interviewing a nine-year-old boy about some pretty serious abuse, and he wouldn't talk at all. And without his disclosure, I had no other evidence for a case and he just wasn't going to do it because he was abused by an adult male and now here's an adult male sitting in front of him and he didn't want to talk to me so when kids are that young we we protocol is you have limitations on how long before it turns into a, a fishing expedition and that will kill your case with any decent defense attorney so exasperatedly knowing i'm running out of time and i've gotten nowhere i just leaned back my chair said, uh, tell me who your favorite superhero is. And the kid changed instantly. I mean, he sat up in the chair and he screamed Iron Man. He jumped up and he started flying around the room. He's like, well, tell me why I like Iron Man. And he's going on and on. And we talk about the Avengers. We talked about Ant-Man. And this is a different kid. Different really? Kid. Down and happy. And now he's relating to me because I tell him why I like Spider-Man and that Batman's the world's greatest detective and I'm a detective. And this, that, and the other. And finally he sat down and I said, you know, I thanked him for telling me all that. And I'm like, hey champ, I heard something bad might've happened to you. He said, yeah. And I said, well, tell me all about it. And he did, he did. And I was able to get a confession and uh, put him away. Wow. And I, as that little boy left, it, the thought just kind of is like the light bulb, the epiphany moment. But how cool would it have been to give him an Iron Man action figure? We didn't have anything like that. And if that kid loves superheroes, a bunch of other kids are going to love them too. They all do. And so it kind of dawned on me looking around the lobby of the child center. It's like, well, this is some pretty boring artwork. Why don't we get superhero posters in here? Why don't we put comic books in the book rack? So I approached my sergeant. It's a great idea. I talked to the center director. She lost her mind and said, we're looking for an event in September. Anyway, why don't we have a superhero September here? And wow. so that's how it started. We had three weeks to plan it. We had six superheroes show up, all fire fighters and police officers in horrible Halloween costumes. <laughs> but we did have the Bat Batmobile. It showed up. Uh, one of the local uh, TV stations came, got us on the air, and uh, that's how it all started. I mean, it was just wow. it's just some random accident, and it, it just people kept talking about it as it went on. I got a call from a Target store manager who. Who said I saw you on TV? I'd love you to come to my store. I'll give you two hundred fifty dollars to, to shop for the center here. Jeez. One of our command, our lieutenants at the time, who's now a retired commander, is working in the county attorney's office. He called me and said, "Hey, I know someone who did cosplay. Would you want her number? Maybe she can help you find some costume heroes." I'm like, "Sure." So I called her. She said, "Love to do it." She goes, "I know a guy who plays Captain America. You want him to come?" I'm like, "Well, yeah." So wow. we're be cooler me going to target with 250 dollars or taking black widow and captain america to target <laughs> right right and so that was a huge success and that little event turned into our biggest event series called the superhero shopping spree um we had four of them last year spent over thirty thousand um, dollars gave it all away wow. but captain mm -hmm. america turned captain america was a guy named gus matos a uh, former professional wrestler just started a cosplay group called Heroes United Arizona. They had eight members. He said, what do I got to do to do this with you again? 
I said, well, I don't have any other events scheduled. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, why don't we plan on doing the same thing next year? Can you get me some more heroes? He goes, yeah, I'll get you 20. He brought 30. Wow. Next year he brought 40. Next year he brought 50. And it just started growing from there. And after year four, we had developed, we found out everything not to do. Year two was horrible. It sucked. Nothing we did worked. We got, <laughs> we got a rubber chicken as a donation at an event. You know, so we still have it in the garage. And I, I, again, I failed. I had something that was working. I didn't know how to work it. So simplicity is always the answer in everything that we do. Simplicity. That's right. When you hear hoofbeats, don't think horses, think zebras maybe. Keep it simple, stupid. Simple, Sean. Yes. And so I, the, the shopping sprees work, so I did more of those. The super main event, which it became, I did. I got better at putting that together. And after year four, we had raised uh, almost $40,000 in one month. Wow. It started dawning on me that success has many followers. And a lot of people were now coming hat in hand, wanting that money for what they wanted it for. And, I, you know, being a police officer, I couldn't handle it anyway. Right. I didn't go over to somebody for, you know, 501c3. I couldn't be involved in any of that. But it started going places that I didn't approve. Not my, not my intent of where I wanted the money to go. So I said, you know what? I'm going to start my own 501c3. Um, I called it Put on the Cape, a foundation for hope. Um, I elected a board of directors, two treasurers who handle all the money. I have nothing to do with any transaction monetarily. Right. You know, the bank account. And we went out on our own. Um, we did our first 5K last year. And I was told by the organizer, you have no footprint in 5Ks. Superhero 5K, cool concept, but no one knows about you. You'll be lucky to get 100 runners and break even. We got 430 runners and made $10,000. <laughs> wow. People resonated with it. And then the first, we moved the event indoors, the big event in September for the fifth annual year in a, in a mall. Um, we drew 3,500 people. And raised twenty three thousand dollars in three hours. Jeez, and that's we, tremendous! And we gave away fifteen thousand dollars of superhero T shirts and superhero action figures. Holy cow! Two different family advocacy centers. So, and, so there's there's a rocket out your back here with this thing. There's a rocket on my back. We all, I also did my first golf tournament that year, and uh, <laughs> I recruited one of my friends who probably isn't my friend anymore because. <laughs> He said, I don't know how you do all these events. This one is kicking my ass. He's, a, he's, a, he's an Irish hooligan from Chicago, and uh, he's on the fourth. He just made sergeant out here, and uh, he put together one hell of a golf tournament. We, we raised $33,000 in our golf tournament. Holy cow. And in one month in September, we raised $150,000. And you? Uh... And, yeah, and it just it just blew up. Yeah. Just and now it. you uh, you have brought, put on the cape. This is the foundation that you created. That's right. That's Herbie. That's her. Put little on one. the cape is a uh, foundation for hope. Yep, it's a five hundred one c three. We raise money and in kind donations, diaper, shoes, food, school supplies, and we give it to child advocacy centers. I take no salary as founder and president of the board of directors. Nobody takes a salary. Our cosplay group is volunteer. Once we get an administration grant for salaries, we'll start paying us something. Yeah. But in the meantime, people give me money to give to centers, and that's where it goes. So, and you have brought that back to your home state, right? I did. Tracy Labor, um, our classmate, she is a marketing manager for a credit union, did an event last year based on my footprint here, and they raised five thousand dollars their first year. That's for, awesome. For two different centers, so I. I helped them with a cosplay group called the League of Enchantment in Michigan. They brought 20, 30 heroes to Houghton Lake, and we had a super main event there, and uh, they raised $12,000 in their second year. Jeez. That's this great. Probably things kind of went sideways on everyone. And uh, we had seven events we canceled this year so far because of the COVID. Yeah. So we're struggling, but I created a virtual 5K this year. And How's so that work? It, Works pretty not pretty awesome. You go to Eventbrite, uh, superhero virtual 5K, and you get a Batman finishers medal and Batman T-shirt. And uh, people have we were in 15 states right now. We've got 15 more, states, 15 different states. Wow, 
it blows my mind every time I see it. You know, South Carolina, North Carolina, Wyoming, uh, you know, Texas, New Mexico, Illinois, Michigan, St. Louis. It blows my mind the reach of, of what we're doing. And we're hopeful we can have events in September. We had a huge event planned in June. I'm expanding the super main event to different cities. And this isn't exclusive to us. This is everybody. People are losing everything. Yeah. And But people are still donating to us. And I think it's because they know how transparent I am. I'm doing a fundraiser for my birthday that I'm going to give every penny of it to the Glendale Family Advocacy Center. And uh, that's, that's awesome. going to happen. Sean, where can people go to if they want to donate to the cause? Where where can you where should we point them to? Put on the cape.org. And on there are photos from all of our events. There's a donate button right on the main page. You can sign up for the virtual 5K. And uh, you can find us on Facebook. Put on the Cape Foundation for Hope. Like our page. We we still post. I'm making motivational posters out of our superheroes, and we've got some great costume heroes. And Gus has put Gus and Johnny Carwell and the old my my OGs Jamie Mullins and Scott Snover and Guy and the, and the, and Sin Shepherd. I mean, they they do they sold out, man. They drank the Sean Kool Aid. <laughs> Where uh, is uh, putting on the Cape? Is uh, is that on social media anywhere they can that you can follow? It is uh, Instagram. Put on the Cape and Twitter. Put on the Cape Foundation for Hope. And those are both beyond my skill set. So I have people do that for me. As uh, we found out, Zoom was above both of ours today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got some troubleshooting to do with that. Yeah, you started with the six shooter too, probably. Yeah, right? No, yeah, right. Oh, gosh. right. But, uh, yeah, so they'll find us all over social media because that's all we can do right now. Okay. And, uh, I tell you what, I tell you what I'm going to do. As um, soon as we're done with this uh, with this podcast, uh, the Chiefs C4 podcast is going to make a monetary donation to put on put them on the Cape. How about that? Awesome, brother. Much All right. I'm gonna yeah. do it. And I'll tell you, it's gonna to go to a child, every bit of it. And if you uh, if you have one here in Michigan, let me know. I'll help you out. Oh, that's fantastic. We're still yeah. hoping for another event in Home Lake. So yeah, that's stay awesome. Here, man, love to have you up there. Okay. Here, Detective Sergeant. Great deal. Good deal. Well, let me ask you too about something else. And you have, like I've said, you um, you your social media is something to follow. But you got these dogs. Um, you got a uh, French bulldog, right? Loki, Loki, also known as Satan Stater Top. <laughs> and then the star of the show is the dog that you simply refer to as the Chuck. The Chuck, this is an overweight chihuahua, right? Meatloaf, he's a 15 pound black and or a brown and tan chihuahua. <laughs> is it true? Is it true that Chuck? Um, or the Chuck has a, his own calendar called 12 months of Chuck. And is it true that Chuck may or may not have been banned from Petco for life? Both those are true. <laughs> <laughs> you got to tell me why, what happened with Petco? The Chuck got banned from Petco. Um, <laughs> first, let's go back to PetSmart. Uh, we brought the Chuck in there for some basic services and Chuck's an adorable little dog, but <laughs> Oh, he reminds me, he is just a little dog. Um, he he was rescued from a kill shelter. We've never been able to unscramble the abuse from his mind. Um, he's very defensive, quite defensive, with just about everybody but my wife. So the first time we brought him in to, <laughs> to PetSmart, as soon as we got there, and they looked at us as, oh, you're Chucky's parents. <laughs> that wants to see you. And so they put together a protocol for handling the chuck. He must be <laughs> drugged to the point his tongue's hanging out, must be muzzled, can only be put in ground floor kennels, and Melissa is the only one that can take him out of the kennel, or they won't accept him. We his, had to sign a waiver to bring him back. His he reputation tore, preceded him? His, he tore the place apart. Just <laughs> tore that. Um, so he, we get him so high, but he's he's wise to us. I found six puppy Prozac spit into a corner when I was vacuuming the house once. I couldn't believe that dog. Come on. So, yeah, he spits out the puppy Prozac from the food. He finds it and spits it into a corner. The, the, he's become self-aware. It's troubling. That's unbelievable. We're taking the pet code to get his nails done, and they have a new protocol there that 
they cannot take the dog physically because if he's wrapped in a blanket and Melissa has him and gives him and while well, she talks to him to someone, he's fine. But they said, you have to put him on the floor now. We have to pick him up. That did not go well. <laughs> it did not go well. In fact, one of the girls had to jump on a table to get away from him. <laughs> they finally got gloves on and got him on the table, put the little leash on him. He, he peed everywhere to the point he's running in place and in his own urine. When sliding off the table and was swinging back and forth like a Big Ben pendulum. Oh, and, my God. And they're trying to get him out. He's biting them. He's going nuts. He's losing his mind. So we, the Chuck the Chuck was deep six from Petco. We could not bring him to that Petco or any of their subsidiaries <laughs> in the valley. <laughs> but he has his own calendar. 12 months of Just Chuck is in its third year. And the, uh, the May edition is May the Chuck Be With You. Look at him, made the check. <laughs> with you. And one of his biggest fans' his birthday is on the 14th, so it says Chuck Celebrate Scotty. Right? <laughs> on May 12th, where it says Chuck Ignored Human's birthday, because that's my uh, birthday. That is tremendous, man. People order this calendar uh, on a yearly basis, and they get it for Christmas every year. <laughs> He's kind of a celebrity, huh? He's a bit of a celebrity. He's got his own Instagram and... Uh, <laughs> What's the Instagram? What is it under? Just Chuck 50. Just Chuck 50? Yeah. In fact, the memes, you know, the gangster Chuck meme, I had on a tote bag. And we were at one of my events, and someone looked at the the, the, the tote. They goes, oh, my God, I love that dog's memes. <laughs> well, no, that's my dog. He goes, that's a real dog? Goes, yeah, that's the Chuck. Yeah, it's hilarious. Memes are all over the place. I mean, people know the Chuck far and wide, and people I don't even I haven't talked to in a while always say, "Hey, Sean, how's Chuck?" <laughs> I'm doing fine, you know. Chuck's all right, but yeah, he's uh, he's my little fat buddy. Oh my god, that is great, yeah. man. Great, man. So you have a third dog now? Yeah. Well, we've had we we've had Demon Puppy before we got the Chuck. She's three point eight pounds of sass and vinegar. That one, little Chihuahua. But uh, we got Satan's Tater Tot. Uh, she turned two today. And uh, international French Bulldog page, and it's got a following that you wouldn't believe. Is that right? Yeah, people just love Satan's Tater Tot. I, I do videos <laughs> of her. She's just off the wall crazy, man. That's crazy. Yeah, sure, Chief. <laughs> That's awesome, man. So you got to have fun. How's the, um, how's the, uh, uh, COVID-19 stuff going out there with you guys. From what I'm looking at, you guys aren't too bad sitting out there for cases. We're not. Um, social distancing. And that's the thing with people. It's like, well, the hospitals aren't full. We need to go and open again. Well, that might possibly be because everyone stayed home Yeah, and, and flattened the curve. Um, we're opening up. Salons open today. Barbershops open today. Uh, restaurants are opening on Monday. And so we're going to be one of the first states to open. Nice. Yeah, you guys only have over, just over 10,000 cases and only 500 deaths. I mean, that's a lot of deaths, you know, but compared to uh, Michigan, we're kind of a mess over here. You know, we're over uh, 4,000 deaths now, 45,000 plus cases. So, Awful. yeah, Metro Detroit's taking a, taking a beating down there. And the heat here helps, too. Um, I, you got to believe it does. Rather, 85 degrees is the uh, the end game for the virus, and it's been in the hundreds for weeks. And but people have been out anyway. You know, as, as in Michigan, they go out anyway. You're already in the hundreds there, huh? Yeah, it was 105 today. Wow, it'll be 100 100 straight tomorrow, and it's only early May. I can't imagine working the street wearing a vest in 105 degree heat, man. And that's nothing because July it gets 118. That's insane. It is insane, and it's brutal. It really is. I mean, you 100 SPF sunscreen, you hydrate, you drink so much water, you don't even feel like you're drinking water. It's yeah. just, you never get used to it. You guys must have it down where you're just doing a lot of relief uh, at long scenes and stuff, eh? Oh, absolutely. We rotate big time. You do a lot of proactive patrol on the PA. Yeah, you over there, stop, stop messing around. I don't want to get out of the car. Right. Oh, it's too hot. I mean, I, I took a whole stolen vehicle report inside the car, and did they just slid things in through the window on July once? It was just too hot. Jeez. You just make do. You know, you make do, and uh, crime doesn't take a vacation. You're correct. And it Job security, it. baby. Yeah. Job yeah. security. Well, um, 
what else is going on? Anything else? Um, well, coming up on my 53rd birthday, hoping to come home to see my family. Bringing the illustrious Melissa with you? Oh, yeah. She's more popular than I am, which doesn't take a lot. Uh, <laughs> people, love, people love my dogs and my wife. You know? Now, is she, uh, is she a superhero? She is. She's Bat uh, Batwoman. I thought I saw a picture of Batwoman. I thought it was your wife. In the Black Canary. Now, has, has the founder himself suited up? I have not. Um, the only one I'd, I'd want to do is Captain America, and that's what Gus does. I thought it was tremendous. You had a picture posted, I think, on your website of you holding uh, one of the superheroes' hammer, and you were just drinking coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was supervising. Carrie, yeah. Big, it was Harley Quinn's, uh, Harley Quinn's mallet. Yes. Yes. Good guy, man. Yeah. I just, these guys, it's their show. You know, I, I would have nothing without people who support me. Yeah. And, and Gus, you know, meeting Gus changed everything. Uh, meeting Danielle, my uh, secretary, changed everything. And just the people that you meet who love what you do. Yeah. And I just, you know, we grew up in a place that doesn't have stoplights. You know, I'm, I'm just a country boy from Michigan. I had an idea. I shared it with people who loved it. And it just went from there. Yeah. And, of course, I, I, I live and breathe it. I can tell you this. I know in Lansing, they just built a new child advocacy center. Good deal. And if just, I was to mention your organization to them, you do. might you might be connected to them. Yeah, Seamus Smith is the head of the League of Enchantment out there, and he does a lot of work for Sparrow. Yeah. And he's the one that does my, my – I partner with for Michigan events, so that would be awesome to do one for Lansing in that center. Yeah, we will uh, – we'll see if we can make that happen for you. I would appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is the car show going to be uh, canceled this year? They posted yesterday that they haven't made a decision, but they will by May 20th. Can they really stop people from coming? Well, that's the thing. And I know and you know better than most, working it as you did and being in it as you were, they're coming anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 45 years. They're coming anyway. You're right. You know, and, and so they can try. They can try. But yeah. I hope I can come home, see my parents. Our 35th high school reunion is this summer. Are you going to come back? I'd like to if we can. If I got we... it marked on the calendar. Um, I'm going to teach up at Northern Michigan that um, that week, and so I'm just going to make a, a trip of it, and uh, the wife and I are going to go up, and uh, I'm going to make an appearance because I'm going to be uh, – when that happens, I'll be about two weeks away from pulling the plug. So I'll be, uh, I'll be ready to have a few uh, – a few drinks and uh hope to see you there not have to write any memos anymore <laughs> that's right that's right so i'm uh, i'm looking forward to catching up with you again oh absolutely this was a lot of fun man all right well i appreciate you coming on and uh telling that great story i think that's uh inspiration for others that are out there that uh you know uh it's never too late man you can chase it as long as you believe in yourself you can do anything you're right right all right buddy we'll catch up all right Great to see you again, Kyle. Take care, my friend. Okay, you take care. And there you have it. Episode 8 in the books with the great Sean Ravey. Uh, great conversation with a uh, sharp dude. Uh, always had, you know, great admiration for Sean. He's such a smart guy and uh, very proud of him, what he's doing out there out west. Um basically told the story of rising from the ashes and um you know rebuilding himself mentally and and physically and and making it to his dream job and then once he got there just excelling and uh doing great things with the with the kids with his uh, foundation um uh, put on the cape dot org as a uh foundation for hope for kids that are subjected to abuse and uh He's bringing that. I think he said he's in 15 states now. So great stuff. And then the always humorous stories about his dogs. Uh, um, just epic stuff. You, know, you ought to check out the uh, the YouTube or the uh, Instagram page for his dog. Uh, uh, I think he said it was just Chuck uh, 50 was the uh, Instagram tag. So check that out. And then make sure that you're... Uh, subscribing to the c4 podcast and click the bell so you get new notifications when we uh post new uh, content and i'm uh, looking forward to uh coming up with some 
some more interesting guests in the uh, coming weeks and um, we'll post them up as soon as we get uh, get those people scheduled up we'll post all of our updates on our uh, social media site uh, at uh, on Twitter at the Chief C4 podcast and on our website as well at www.chiefsc4podcast.com. Have a great night, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you soon down the road.